into our program Thrill and Critically. And today our special guest is Robert Van Boren, who is a human rights activist. He's also a Sovietologist. He's also director of our university's Andrei Sakharov Center. And uh, he has a very large experience working for mental health in Ukraine. And uh, we would like to uh, start with the uh, First question from Professor Gintotas Muzikis. We also have another name for Robert von Warren, Johannes Bax. <laughs> yeah, uh, nice. Thank you, uh, uh, Johannes and uh, von Warren in one uh, person uh, for, for the participation. And I know that you have a very uh, big and uh, um, good experience uh, in the studies, critical studies of uh, uh, Soviet uh, psychiatric policy. As well, you are involved now in uh, Ukraine, you know, in the in those studies and help of uh, post-traumatic and traumatic, actually traumatic situations, psychic traumas in the period of Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, could you describe, first of all, uh, which, uh, what kind of problem you do you uh, consider now? What you meet, what kind of problem do you uh, meet in uh, Ukraine in contemporary period? Ooh, in Ukraine, I think you are now uh, seeing, you know, the whole specter of trauma. So this is, first of all, uh, with um, uh, the millions of refugees, uh, both internal refugees, internally displaced persons and refugees outside. Uh, the whole shock of having been evicted from their homes, uh, having to leave their families. Uh, most of the refugees outside the country are women with children. So husbands have been left behind. Uh, the fear of what is going to happen to them, uh, because if they have not been drafted yet, they might be drafted. They can uh, you know, be sent to the front. So um, this is a high level of anxiety. And we see now, like um, about a year after the start of the invasion, that this trauma is really starting to appear uh, because the first phase is gone. Uh, initially, people thought that maybe the war will uh, last a few months, maybe half a year. And so they left the country temporarily. And now, you know, the reality is settling in that it might be for long and that there is a category which is not going to return because there's nothing to to return to. And so they have to start building a new life. Um, and so there's a lot of problems with children uh, because they have lost their, you know, their uh, social network and they have to start all over again with a new language and everything. So that's one, uh, mm -hmm. so that's and, one and, category, yeah? And uh, OK, OK, continue, please. Uh, all these categories later, I will ask you. Yeah. OK, so the second category is, of course, related to the military. Uh, again, that's the military volunteers uh, themselves who are sent to the front. Uh, but it's also the families that are left behind. Uh, so the anxiety, are they coming back? Uh, knowing that the number of people that are being killed at the front is uh, quite high. Um, it's uh, initially, you know, funerals were regular but with intervals now it's sometimes several a day uh in in towns and in villages and so um that is a fear which is um, uh, destroying uh, any kind of ability to function normally in life and then we have the people at the front who you know are living on adrenaline but there is a day when they will uh, return uh, we know of units that have been at the front, um, you know, directly fighting for several months. And so a lot of them are in deep psychological distress, are just not able to function anymore. Uh, too many people they have seen dead, too many people lost, either missing in action or taken prisoner. Um, and so... Um, uh, some of them wind up in psychiatric hospital because they are uh, shell shocked, uh, you know, um, because the war is of a specific type of nature. It's very similar to what we have seen in northern France in the, during the First World War. The front hardly moves. Uh, 
but it's this constant shelling and really, you know, everything uh, being blown to pieces. And then you have the ones that eventually uh, become veterans. And we know that a significant number of them will have psychological consequences. Uh, and that part of them will wind up in the prison system because they will commit uh, violent crimes out of trauma. And so the country is not prepared for this. And this is an area where we are trying to uh, work. Um, we are training mental health professionals. Um, they're one of the areas, one of the most important areas is dealing with grief and mourning, uh, in particular because there is a uh, considerable number of people that are gone. Uh, people have no idea whether they're still alive. Are they in uh, uh, POW camps? Are they missing an action? Uh, are their bodies ever uh, going to be uh, found? Uh, and that is a specific type of grief, which is very difficult to deal with. And then we have the mental health field itself. Uh, you know, of the mental health institutions in the country, about a third is not functioning anymore, either because they've been destroyed, bombed or evacuated. Um, so the the life of people working in mental health is already very difficult because of, uh, you know, uh, the working conditions and then of, of what they notice, what they what they encounter. There is a deficit of uh, neuroleptics. There is a deficit of other uh, materials. And, you know, uh, bombing has a effect on people uh, without mental health problems, but on people with mental health problems, of course, this is a, a double, double reaction. And so it's very hard to maintain these uh, these patients. Robert, uh, I would like uh, to, uh, to concretize uh, my uh, question related to the institutions which you started to discuss, you know, is psychiatric institutions, it could be social institutions and uh, I would say hospital or psych just psychiatric institutions. Uh, Ukraine uh, had uh, quite a large system of these institutions before uh, the, this big war started. And they had as well possibility to develop some of them after 2014, you know, and because they learn from uh, abroad, from uh, different countries about different syndromes, in any way, in some way, they should be prepared or not prepared. Could you critically comment the situation of this uh, network, this system of hospitals, psychiatric health and social health? Okay, so after 2014, after Maidan, uh, we had the feeling that this was the right moment to bring about uh, a real reform in mental health care, to break down the old Soviet system, institutional system, and to develop community mental health care services. Um, this process started, um, but then uh, in 2020, we got COVID. So a lot of, uh, you know, what was planned was not implemented. And I think the uh, tragedy of Ukraine is that um, people are trained in uh, normal international mental health care uh, provision, but cannot implement it because the system is outdated. So I knew quite a lot of uh, psychiatrists in the country who were, you know, really distressed because they know how they should be functioning, but they cannot because the system is just not there. And one of the worst part was, of course, the uh, social care home system, the Psychonevrologitsky and the Nati, which are basically large coffins. Um, by the time COVID started, there were still more than 30,000 people locked up uh, for life. It's a life sentence uh, without any crime. And some of these institutions are really uh, horrendous. Some of them are trying to, you know, to create a kind of human environment. Uh, we worked in several of them, including one in Slavyansk, uh, which already had difficulty because uh, basically all the patients had been, or all the clients had been evacuated from the LNR DNR. And so their number of uh, patients was double. Uh, but now this social care home in Slavyansk has been evacuated and all the patients are in Lutsk and in Khmelnytska Oblast and in the West. And so there, the overcrowding is just absolutely uh, massive. Um, so uh, one of the interesting thing is that uh, before the invasion, 
Finally, we saw the development of mobile mental health teams. So small teams of professionals who visit people at home uh, to take care of them and prevent them from being hospitalized. And then, of course, the invasion started. Some of the teams had to stop functioning, uh, like in Kramatorsk, uh, because it's too close to the front line. But in particular, in the south, they are working in uh, Nikopol, in Mykolaiv, in Odessa, and they're doing absolutely amazing work. Um, and I, you know, my feeling is that this war will uh, bring about a fundamental change because um, finally mental health has become mainstream. People understand that they are needed because of the traumas that, uh, you know, is inflicted on the population. And there are lots of young people who have entered the mental health field. And so I hope that that will really uh, bring about the change that we need. Uh, may I ask you um, slightly to shift uh, from Ukraine to, to Russia itself? Uh, before the war started, uh, during the so very long Putin's regime, uh, political prisoners uh, who were opponents of Putin's regime, who criticized uh, corruption, uh, who criticized his uh, uh, ways uh, of running the country, uh, those people, uh, some of them were simply killed as uh, political murders, but uh, some others who were supposed to be lucky to survive were put into mental hospitals. Just uh, uh, a very fresh story about uh, Shaman Gabishev, who wanted to go to Moscow by foot from Siberia to chase away the demon Putin. He was put into a psychiatric hospital. Is it a continuation of Soviet uh, tradition uh, to deal with political opponents, treating them as supposedly insane? Uh, what is your comment on this? Yes, I think it's, you know, Russia is one of the countries where we failed to bring about a fundamental change in psychiatry. <laughs> Uh, there were in the 1990s attempts um, in St. Petersburg. There was a St. Petersburg Psychiatric Association, which was chaired uh, by uh, a, a, a guy who, uh, an old friend of ours, uh, Yuri Nuller, who was a survivor of Kalima, uh, nine years of Kalima, he had behind his cheeks. Uh, when he died, this association you know, uh, kind of um, disbanded, stopped functioning. There was an attempt in Siberia, in Tomsk, uh, to set up a Siberian psychiatric association. But then on the Putin, we see that, uh, you know, the old structure is put back and it's the same nomenclatura, which is in, in, in charge of psychiatry in Russia. It's the kids of those who abuse psychiatry. Um, and the Putin, again, we see that opponents are being diagnosed. Um, sometimes it's used, uh, sometimes not. Uh, the ladies Pussy Riot, um, they were all uh, uh, examined by psychiatrists. They were all diagnosed as having mental health problems. Uh, the only difference is that uh, it's now not called sluggish schizophrenia, but it's called uh, personality disorders. But the symptoms are the same. Uh, struggle for the truth, uh, overvaluing yourself, um, uh, being um, a persistent, uh, stubborn, you know, um, everything that a political activist <laughs> has uh, is considered mental mental illness. And Gabushev is a very clear example uh, where they are actually afraid of him. And he is still in psychiatric hospital. Uh, we've been issuing uh, yearly reports about the political abuse of psychiatry in Russia. And we see we see that um, um, the, the number of cases is increasing. Uh, the system is quite similar. The only difference is usually the hospitalization is shorter, except in the case of Gabishev. Um, and the category which is particularly targeted is the, uh, are the Crimean Tatars in uh, Crimea, uh, many of whom are psychiatrically persecuted. And uh, there, I would like to a little bit turn from the critique uh, of uh, Soviet or uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, psychiatric system back to a contemporary, which is uh, similar probably from mental case of uh, uh, you uh, in Russia and Ukraine, and not from political, 
but and you mentioned about anxiety, very deep anxiety between people, different sorts of anxiety. And ordinary, when we, in our popular discussion, we uh, consider anxiety, we relate it with, with the problem of depression. Uh, this is uh, like depression, and uh, we use uh, different anti-depressions, anti uh, you know, some me medicine or some other cognitive psychology help there. But as I understand uh, that uh, situation in uh, Ukraine uh, or in frontline, it's much more... Uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, complex, and uh, that is uh, not possible to explain this all these syndromes only through this uh, uh, depression. You know, uh, what kind of other uh, psychological categories do you use in order to describe the syndromes or situation with these people and the pressing of anxiety? Well, you know, I think one of the big issues in uh, many of these countries um, is the stigma. Um, uh, not um, being, well, first of all, not recognizing that you have mental health issues, uh, not recognizing that it's a normal thing to have mental health problems. Uh, it's a part of life. Um, and uh, not being able to talk about it openly. So this is at all levels. Uh, you know, uh, we know that uh, statistically about uh, every 10th person will die with uh, dementia. Uh, one out of four will have a serious mental health problem in his or her life. Um, but that is in that part of the world something that you better not talk about. Uh, it's has changed in Ukraine. And the, the funny thing is, I noticed that in Ukraine, it really changed when we started our self-help programs. So after the president's elections in Belarus, uh, you know, in August 20, when the repression started, we set up a program called Samopomoch, which is a program to help people help themselves with their anxiety and with their depression and their suicidal thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we also provide online free consultation to human rights defenders. And it took a long time for them to come forward and actually accept that they are helped by a therapist. Because in their view, someone who is a human rights defender needs to be strong. And if you acknowledge that you have a mental health uh, you know, problem, or if you're depressed or anxious or panicking, uh, then you're weak. And you cannot do that as a human rights activist. In Ukraine, this is much more open, uh, and we see it. We have now a Ukrainian language program, Samopomic, um, which functions the same as the Russian language one. And, uh, you know, uh, for example, on Facebook, we have over 60 million views. Uh, so it's a vast number of people that realize that they need assistance in order to deal with this. Um, the um, So actually, we human beings are much more resilient than we sometimes think. Uh, the only issue is that sometimes uh, you have a problem that you need to face and you need to deal with. It's like, you know, I have bad knees, for instance. So I know that I need to take, uh, you know, pills in order to keep my knees functioning because otherwise I will walk like an old, old, old man. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, the, the the whole issue with mental health uh, problems is that it is much wider than we often think. And we tend to give um, uh, problems a name, a uh, etiquette, in order to make it more logical for us. So, for instance, the term schizophrenia is actually, uh, it covers a whole wide range of mental health issues, which are all called schizophrenia. Um, but I think in 10 years from now, schizophrenia will not be used as a term anymore because this diversification and understanding of what is happening is going deeper, deeper and deeper. Um, but at the same time, we see also that um, actually over time, yes, our medication becomes more sophisticated, but the um, the curing of people with mental health problems is not much progressing. It's not getting much better. 
what is getting much better is accepting that people have mental health problems and help them to learn to live with it, right? So this is also with trauma. Um, you can live with trauma. You just need to be taught how to live with your trauma, right? But, uh, Robert, you mentioned that they, uh, many of them couldn't uh, recognize uh, what's going on with them. And I think that many of them try to help uh, themselves uh, by drinking alcohol. Uh, what is the problem? How do you solve this uh, problem with alcoholism in the front line in, uh, uh, in, and in these uh, cities, uh, uh, not in front line, where people would like to escape from their panic or anxiety or, uh, you know, some uh, hallucinations even? You know that uh, uh, these region people have tradition that's uh, to use alcohol in this uh, sense, or even uh, drugs in sense narcotics. You know, not, uh, just what what they are doing. What do, what are you doing? What what, what these uh, commissions uh, uh, societies uh, do with this alcoholism problem? Uh, if I may to add, is it? Uh... Uh, on the Russian soldiers' problem with alcoholism, or is it also to some degree Ukrainian soldiers? Because in our uh, Lithuanian and Western media, Ukrainian soldiers are portrayed as as angels, uh, but uh, when there's the war, frontline shelling, uh, but perhaps it's not only Russian soldier issue. I think I, I think the Ukrainian army is much more strict with regards to the use of alcohol. Um, and understands that if you have a free access to alcohol, you create an army which is not able to function anymore. I think that's a fundamental difference between the Ukrainian army and the Russian army. Right. So the Ukrainian army since 2014 has made enormous progress in becoming a really professional army. The issue with veterans um, and with people who come back from the front Yes, they um, uh, abuse alcohol, they get drunk, but I think this is something which um, um, you should not forbid it. You know, there, there needs to be a period when a person needs to get it out of their system and just, you know, forget about what happened, right? Let them drink. The way you can prevent this from becoming a serious problem is by helping a veteran to return to life, to reconnect with the family, to go back to work, to have a roof over the head, to have the feeling that they are needed by their uh, by their family, by their spouse, by their kids, and to have a meaningful life, right? And because then you get a totally different situation. Because if you have a meaningful life and you have people that are dependent on you, uh, the urge to you know to get totally drunk uh, becomes much less. It's and this is something that we, of course, the field has learned along the way. Um, uh, I remember one of the big changing uh, moments uh, is the tsunami in 2004, um, where, uh, for instance, in Sri Lanka, where I've been working for for many years. There was this huge influx of Western aid organizations and psychologists and God knows what. And so they went to the villages on the coastline and they wanted that these fishermen sit in groups um, in circles talking about their trauma. Fishermen were not interested in talking about their trauma. They wanted to get the boat in order to go out and feed their children, you know, to feed their family. And so it's these very basic things that need to be taken care of. And then there is a small category which needs professional help. Um, in 2014, uh, when the war started in the East, I remember there was a, a meeting at the, uh, uh, at, the, at the Lithuanian Embassy in Kiev. And one of the uh, persons there was the Deputy Minister of Health of uh, Ukraine, who was saying 95% of the combatants who come back need psychiatric help. And this ran off all my alarm bells because this is the most stupid thing to do. If you start to talk about trauma at far too early a moment, you actually create a trauma in the minds of people because they think we cannot function anymore. I cannot have normal relationship. I cannot work because I'm traumatized. 
it's only four or five percent of the people who actually need professional help. The other, you need to help to get their lives back in order. And so uh, we brought um, the chief psychiatrist of the British Armed Forces several times to Ukraine to explain that, you know, what you are actually creating is a problem which is not there. Um, so it's, you know, things are um, very often uh, misunderstood, misdetected. Uh, um, I'm working a lot in the prison system, uh, prison mental health. And I remember in 2017, we went to the uh, big prison in Dnipro, which has um, about 400, 500 uh, prisoners, uh, among them people who are serving a life sentence. And so we asked the director that, uh, you know, how many psychiatric cases do you have? How many of your uh, prisoners have uh, mental health problems? Oh, he said, well, well, I think uh, probably around four are a little bit depressed. This is impossible. The the level of mental health problems in a Ukrainian prison is not different than in uh, in, a, in a Western prison, right? In the prison system, 75% of the prisoners have mental health issues, and one out of four have serious mental health problems. If you don't detect it, you create an environment in which aggression becomes standard uh, between the prisoners, among the prisoners, and between the staff and the prisoners because it's all this emotion and this anger which needs to find a way out. And uh, uh, let's uh, back to the to, to this comparative analysis with Russia, you know, and uh, about future, uh, we, could, we, we need to imagine because in any way, uh, science as well as psychiatry is very prognostic and we always think about uh, future society. And you presented uh, the problems in Ukraine and that uh, psych psychiatrists uh, 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 from foreign countries, international and uh, local Ukrainian would like to help. And uh, they have uh, uh, some problems and misunderstanding, don't recognition in, for example, prisons. But uh, there are people like you who works uh, with uh, these uh, prisons who would like to help to explain that uh, or the sources of aggression and so on and now we see uh, the other side in russia you know we see these criminals prisoners uh, on the front line this is uh, wagner of uh, prigozhin you know uh, it's not about hundreds it's about tens of thousands of them and then these uh, tens of thousand criminals uh, i would say it even radical criminals blood maya even and uh, different sorts of them, actually. They mixed uh, with this uh, mobilized uh, people from, uh, as well, non-prepared for, for war, you know, and uh, using, abusing of alcohol. Uh, and after it, after this uh, drinking parties and killing, killing, uh, death and death, uh, they, uh, some of them, uh, return back uh, to the society without zero level explanation was going on with uh, their uh, consciousness, with their psychic. How do you think what will uh, could happen with uh, this society of Russia uh, after this war concerning the problem of psychic uh, trauma? Well, this is, uh, you know, the... Uh, how to put it? It's it's a nightmare scenario. Um, trauma knowledge in Russia was uh, already quite limited. Um, I remember after ba Beslan, um, most of the treatment that the uh, specialists, so-called specialists from Moscow gave to the mothers who lost their children, was uh, by, you know, uh, injecting them with neuroleptics. And then a year after Beslan, they came back and they had this wonderful advice. They said to these mothers, listen, get yourself another child uh, so you forget the one that you lost. Right. It, it shows the level of harshness in society. And some uh, I, I, animal uh, viewpoint on people, you know. That yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so um, the development that uh, societies like the Ukrainian, like the Lithuanian have gone through is a process which in Russia 
uh, started but then stopped. And in a way, it has been reversed. The country is in, first of all, in a survivalist mode. Um, it's re-Sovietized. Uh, you could say it's re-Stalinized. And because the country is run by a criminal gang, uh, criminality has become an absolutely essential element in Russian life. And so the fact that criminals are sent to the front is uh, for, you know, by and large, uh, the, the majority of the Russians, something not strange. Um, because criminality is a daily part of life. So they steal, so I steal as well. The moral decay in society is enormous. And this is, of course, also a process which has been going on for a long period uh, when, um, you know, even in Soviet times, the alcoholism level in, you know, in the provinces in Siberia was very high. You get uh, people who are alcoholic, they get a child together. The child has post-alcohol syndrome but then eventually meets a girl or a man with a post-alcohol syndrome, and they get a kid. So it's a, you know, it's a degrading process. Um, I will never forget um, in the, uh, when was it, 88, 89, uh, we were trying to set up a journal in uh, Moscow together with uh, Larissa Bogoras and Sergei Damich Kovalyov. And Kovalyov came to the meeting with photographs of pre-revolutionary Petrograd. And he showed me these photos and said, listen, look at the faces, you know, all these faces with intelligence, norm, normal people, this is gone. You know, they really created a workers and farmer state, peasant state. And so um, a whole slice of the population which should have, you know, uh, keep the country at a certain moral level has disappeared. Um, and this is a disaster. It's a, it's a complete disaster. And there's no process to try to recover that what is lost. And instead, what you now see is that under Putin, uh, it's a free fall. Um, and then if you look at the future, I think the big problem is that whatever the outcome of the war, uh, Russia is not a country that will be occupied. So you cannot... However much you can compare the situation with Nazi Germany, one thing you cannot do is compare the post-war situation with the, with the German post-war situation, where you have occupying powers who can try to enforce something on the country. And I cannot see how Russia can find um, the moral strength, the power, the 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 change makers who are able to pull Russia out of this decay and bring it back to a normal level that you can you know make it comparable to to the rest of Europe. This is a it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. And I know one thing uh, for sure that is I will never in my lifetime see Russia as a um, normal European country again. This is why Ukraine would like to build iron wall between Ukraine and uh, Russia, because nobody, uh, even between Ukrainian elites, uh, don't, doesn't see possibility to prove or to change uh, something in Russia, because it's like, you know, this is uh, providence, uh, if you would like, this is worse and worse. And I hear from Russians that only very small and very strange belief in the future that Russia will partly, uh, that uh, Tajiks and others will partly occupy Moscow and St. Petersburg. And these new people, new tribes, new tribes with new belief will start completely different life without memory what was uh, here. You know, this is so, so uh, quite terrible story, but in any way, uh, this is most realistic, more probably realistic than that stories from uh, Khodorkovsky and the others. They, they, they would like to build the democratic Russia between uh, what kind of population, you know, between what? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the big problem of uh, a person like Khodorkovsky is that 
he is a oligarch. He has an oligarch mentality. He's no different. You know, for me, with Khodorkovsky, very telling is his memoirs from the 10 years in camp. Um, you know, my the person who brought me into this field, who was a father figure for me, was Vladimir Bukowski. And I think one of the best books about the dissident period is To Build a Castle. He was Vrushait Sevetyar by Vladimir Bukowski. It's fantastic. Uh, it's written with humor, with insight, with, uh, you know, deep thinking, but then put in a way that you can digest it. If you read the book by Khodorkovsky, who spent basically the same amount of years behind bars as Bukowski, it's a very thin book and it's completely superficial. You know, there is no deep thinking there, nothing, nothing whatsoever. What has he been doing for 10 years after bars? You know, it, he hasn't developed any theater. And so this is not a person who will build a different Russia. And I think among the Russian opposition, there are very few who have this possibility to have any depth. But Karamurza, yes. Uh, Yashin, to a certain degree. But uh, Karamurza, you know, this, uh, that's very big uh, fear that he could be killed, you know, yep. now it's... Yeah, because he's a real threat. You know, so anything that can be a danger to the system, you know, will either be poisoned or fall from a balcony. It's a it's a destructive system. And so um, even in that respect, I don't see within the uh, the Russian uh, Russian people, anybody who can become in any way a moral leader. Right. And I think this is it's a disaster. Uh, but it's the disaster of the post-Soviet period. Uh, where are the Havels? You know, uh, where are the Havels? Sakharov was one, but he died too early. Um, in Georgia, you had Kostava, but he was killed in a car accident. Uh, in Ukraine, you had Chernobyl, but he died in a car accident. So, uh, you know, there is this uh, kind of desert, uh, Pustina, uh, with um, where are the new moral leaders in, in these countries. But on the other hand, when we hear also podcast uh, interviews uh, uh, with um, uh, opposition leaders, intellectuals, Russian intellectuals living abroad, uh, who are supposedly now uh, foreign agents, uh, like uh, um, Andrei Penkovsky, uh, I, I see him as a person with wonderful insights uh, sharing from Washington, D.C. Then uh, Alexander Nevzorov from Israel or from wherever he's located. Um, also, he's very devoted to the harsh critique uh, with uh, all this very deep perception of moral decay, the, the term that you here explained. And the, the contrast is that uh, before the war started, uh, Russia seemed quite successful in selling its um, uh, image of a spiritual country, spiritual multi-nation. Dostoevsky, all his uh, uh, ideas about God and uh, uniting uh, uh, Russia as being the mother that the bridge unites Asia and the Western Europe because it has all the spirituality. Now it's all that by paradox seems to collapse and uh, to uh, to show that all that is really uh, quite the opposite. The, the country that was carrying God now is carrying devil. <laughs> well, you, you know, um, first of all, the, uh, uh, when you say uh, he's sitting in Washington, he in Tel Aviv, he in there, I mean, this is... I think this is uh, what you're saying is very important because their connection with Russian, the, the Russian people with Russia itself is non-existent. Um, the Russian opposition, much of which is now in the West, uh, look at Kasparov. Kasparov, nobody in Russia even would think of Kasparov as a future leader, right? Uh, Bukowski thought after uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, that he could become a leader in Russia. And he was uh, registered for the presidential election. Yes, yes. And it was a disaster because the connection with the people is completely gone, right? So this is very important. Then secondly, Russia is the country of facades. 
So these Dostoevskys and all these other people, they are just a, a kind of the crust on the cake. Um, what is under it is something quite different. It's a poor peasant nation which has hardly come out of the slavery period, right? In a way, they are still slaves in this vast country with a nature which is um, inhuman, fundamentally inhuman. Um, uh, uh, Sergei Damish Kovoyov was spending his three years of exile in Magadan, uh, living in an objezitje. He never once saw any of the other people in his building not drunk, right? But then imagine yourself living in Vorkuta or in Salahart. Would you not be totally alcoholic and being boozed the whole day? It's otherwise it's impossible to live there, right? So um, I think um, the, 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 the problem is that there is this image created of Russia, which has um, no bearing on the reality. Um, for me, the most, um, the book that describes Russia the best is uh, Dead Souls by Gogol. You know, this guy that goes out, uh, goes out and he wants to marry this girl and needs to have a certain number of slaves, which he cannot afford. And he's buying dead slaves, dead souls, because then he can prove to the father that he's actually wealthy. It's very Russian. And it's the same Russia it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was the uh, rule as well in uh, uh, Lithuanian Russian Empire time that you, in order to be nobility, you have to prove by quantity of souls and uh, a country estates, you know, you, uh, for example, in order to be graph, uh, you should have as a minimum 100 country estates and somewhere about 10,000 uh, souls. So if you need uh, more souls, you see, you could buy death souls. That's uh, very normal uh, for, I would say, for Google time. And today, I that uh, for example about I, I hear that a lot you know comments about Russia and uh, in Lithuania as well when uh, different analytics consider Russians as uh, from the uh, Russian uh, Western rationality viewpoint that uh, I think I see that here we have uh, the another problem that uh, okay that uh, uh, Western countries would like. Uh, to accept, uh, to consider uh, that, for example, the ideas of good life or the welfare society is the equal for Russians, but they don't consider that, uh, for example, Prigozhin uh, could be leader or not only of gangs and uh, bandits local, but as well it's better than Khodorkovsky or Kasparov for uh, majority of Russians. What does it mean? What does it mean for the democracy and future world if Russians accept Prigozhin rather than uh, uh, Khodorkovsky or Kasparov? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, Prigozhin is for them sweet Chelyviak, right? He is one of us. I remember in 2018, we organized the Donskis conference here in Kaunas. Uh, under the title Building, Br uh, Building Bridges, Thoughts About the Other Russia. And so we had, uh, you know, uh, Ostrowski was there, Shishkin was there, um, uh, Gindelis was there, a uh, whole bunch, uh, uh, Bahmin from Moscow, and they were talking about that there is also another Russia than Putin. And then at a certain moment, uh, when the discussion started, a friend of mine from Chelyabinsk, a human rights activist, got up, um, Nikolai Shur, and he said, uh, no, it's all very wonderful what you're talking, very beautiful, but you forget one thing, the Russian people is beat law. You understand? Beat law. Yeah, beat law, beat law. And, and everybody said, oh, but no, Kolya, now you go too far. Nah, nah, no, nah, th this cannot be. But what, what do we see now? You know, we see that indeed he was absolutely right. It's beat law, you know, and that is what is being sent to the front. And that's why criminals at the front for Russia are absolute uh, normality. And that's why Prigozhin indeed uh, has an appeal in uh, among the people because he's he's like us, you know, and it's normal that we are like we are. It's horrible. How, how <laughs> it's, really, you, it's a disaster. What would be the equivalent in English for that word? 
Пидло, де це антранслейтабл, ватник, сімела. Є ватник, lower, lower classes without any moral, uh, you know, standing, just absolutely empty, empty life, uh, low life. You know, it's, it's, some of these Russian words are extremely difficult to, to translate in, in, in one. Um, but yes, I think that unfortunately, Kolya Shur was absolutely right. And he knew it because he is living behind the Urals. He sees around him, you know, this, this people. Um, and uh, now we see it right at the front in, in, in Ukraine. But uh, to the, we're going towards the end of our program. But uh, I remember uh, a month or two months ago with uh, Professor Majekis, we had uh, also a podcast uh, just like today with uh, uh, the, uh, the president of European, European Cultural Parliament. And uh, we, our, Carl Eric Norman. Carl yes, Eric. Carl Eric Norman. And our topic was what to do now with uh, those honest uh, Russian uh, intellectuals, philosophy professors, uh, artists who has all who have always been uh, critical of the regime. They were doing their work, uh, teaching philosophy, uh, writing their books, or creating the theater performances, and now. They are stuck there, and uh, but they they do not belong to that group that we just uh, tried to describe as Vatnik or Butlo. Uh, so so uh, this empathy for for that group of people because uh, I remember in 2005 2006 when I went to to Moscow for for training as a young as as a young uh, lecturer. Uh, I, I was very impressed by that tradition of Lomonosov University uh, scholars. And, uh, and Gintotas also uh, has his PhD training in St. Petersburg. So is that uh, layer of intellectual potential, is it, is it somehow preserved in, in Russian uh, in universities or, or it's uh, behind the circle somewhere, underground maybe it's gone? <laughs> I think I think we are in in a war period where um, those who are still there are trying to lie low as low as possible, because um, uh, one wrong word and you are in trouble. I think a lot of them have left the country, um, um, and you know my for me the moral d dilemma is. Uh, like with these hundreds and thousands of Russian men that left the country, you know, escaped the draft and escaped the possibility of going to war, um, is that um, if the country loses anybody who is critical uh, and who wants to change the regime, the chance of changing the regime becomes slimmer and slimmer. That's one. Uh, secondly, with a large group that, for instance, went to Georgia, um, they messed up life in Georgia quite fundamentally. Uh, my Georgian friends, they are appalled when they go to a bar. It's as if they're sitting in Russia. Uh, and a lot of them are pretty uh, nagly, uh, in, uh, you know, impudent. They, they behave themselves as if they are at home, that it's their country. And then they are upset if they're asked, uh, who's this Crimea? You know, uh, because they didn't get out of the country because they... Uh, don't share Putin's idea. They just didn't want to go to the front to fight. And so um, I see within myself a kind of radicalization uh, because I have my friends who are at the front in Ukraine um, who are, you know, being traumatized by what is happening, are losing their friends, um, who are fighting for their land. And these people are just, you know, trying to get out and spoil the life for others. And then there is a big problem that uh, out of 10 people leaving the country, you can be sure that at least one of them is F FSB or related to Georu or whatever. So you get this vast influx of spies, moles, which are living outside Russia and are there to create trouble. So my feeling is that the pre-war period and this period is slightly different. We are at war. And that means that there are now different rules than in a non-war period. And it's not only Ukraine that is at war. We are also at war. It's a, it's a, it's a, I wouldn't say a world war, but it's a European war. 
uh, and if the war is not ended in Ukraine, you can be sure that it will be on our doorstep uh, or on Kazakhstan's doorstep or on Moldova's doorstep or on all three. Uh, so yes, we have to be a little bit um, harsh in our decision making and say, well, you know, we very well understand your position, but unfortunately, um, you know, this is the situation and we cannot help you. You need to help yourself. Thank you very much for your wonderful insights and for your valuable time. I would like to remind our viewers that we just had a conversation with uh, Johannes Box, or otherwise known, Robert von Warren, Sovietologist and mental health uh, a great uh, activist for Ukraine and other countries. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you very much. Have a good day.